Hello, good day, and welcome back. So, in this exercise today, we're gonna I really shouldn't call this an exercise. Uh, it's really there's no exercise for you to do. I'm really just looking at an example of a client server architecture, for example, right? Um, so, <clears throat> we talk about how on channel channels are first class. Um, type and citizens in Go language programming. And we've been seeing how we can set integers and string on channels. And then we saw um, a slice of string in the previous example exercise. So here I want to look at channels, sending channels on channels. And so the, ex the example I want to kind of go over with you is just one of many ways of doing things. Remember this, keep this in mind. This is programming. So there are a thousand different ways to do any one thing. And so, or could be. And so, this is just a way you want to, you might want to think about client and server. And so, <clears throat> we can write a Go program which dispatches questions to server. And so it's almost going to look like our previous program, but it's very different, and you're going to see why. The program will use a slice of string to represent the question because we don't want to worry about reading from file or over network. A line of text is a question, so that's going to we're going to pretend that we're writing. We're building our own company here. We're a startup. We're going to be the next Google um, search engine, the next big search engine uh, company. And so we're going to be able to submit questions and we have to be able to answer them. <clears throat> and a server must respond with the question asked and how long it took to complete compute the answer, right? So we're going to get into this. But basically, what we really want to do is get one question and then distribute that question to many servers, right? And then have a server respond with an answer to that question and then, hey, I took 20 seconds to answer this or something. Because we want that kind of metrics, we might want to keep track of how long servers are taking to answer questions so we can kind of see um, either we cut off after a while, we might have a timeout, or we sort of know on average um, how long it's taken to answer questions. So these things can come in handy, right? Collecting metrics. And so, Let's think about a flow, program flow, for example. So we have a database of questions, and this is our client. And here is just showing you one client. Client is going to read a question from the database of questions, submit that question along the light blue line, get it to a server, and the server would look up the answer in its database and then return the answer. <clears throat> We're not going to look at any iterative, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. We're not going to discuss even any iterative solution because we are beyond that. We're going to jump straight to a, a concurrent solution. And so when we kind of expand this out, thinking about it, we, here's our client pulling up these questions and it pulls up questions, put it in some channel because we want to separate things. It just put it in a channel say, here, here's my question, put it in a channel. And then we want to, since we want to take one question and duplicate it to, or think of it as copying it to many servers, well, we need some place where it's going to take that one question and then know how many servers to copy it to. But in this particular side, I'm just showing one server. So this hub takes that question and wraps it up in a request. Now, we could say that this client send a request also, and a request is more complex than just a simple question. And we'll talk about that a little bit later towards the end. Um, but here we're going to say, well, the hub takes your question, wraps it in a request, and a request includes not only the question, but it's also some instructions to the server. And we see what that instruction is, what those additional information to the server is. And when the server gets it, a request, it unpacks it, look at the question, looks in its database, finds the answer if there's, it's there, and then it puts the response back um, on a queue, a response queue, which goes back to the hub. And then now the hub, you can imagine, would take uh, the response from the server, from one, whichever server responded, and then wrote that back to the client, which I do, did not show here, but you can imagine that's what's going to happen. Now, how does the server know where to put that response on that queue towards the end there on the far right? Well, the request contains the response queue. So the hub itself is saying to the server, here's the question and here's the place where I want you to send that response. And that's how we're going to get our channel and channel. So when we send a request on a channel, it's also going to contain, you know, a place to send back um, the response, which is going to be a channel of responses. 
Okay. If that doesn't make any sense to you, we're going to see it in code. We're just kind of going over and talking about it. Now, we don't have to stop there. Um, right now, we're only looking at sending our question to one server, but we want to branch this out, of, of course. And so now, what we're really going to write is something more like this, where our hub distributes that one question into mul creates multiple requests and send them off to different servers. Now, here's where, as the implementer of this solution, you have some decision to make. You can decide well, if it takes a very long time to spin up a server to answer a question, then these are long running servers. So the beginning of the program, I start up my server and they are just sitting around there waiting for questions to come in because I have so many questions coming in and it takes a long time to initialize a server. So you're just sitting there waiting. But you can also imagine that oh, since this is Go and maybe the implementation um, you're using, since you're using Go routine, maybe they're going to be, we know that they're small and lightweight. We have already demonstrated that. And so it doesn't take a long time for them to come up. So it's just, you spin up a Go routine, it come up like that. It go, look somewhere, finds the answer, and we don't need to keep it sitting around, right? To, to minimize our resource usage, which is memory, right? Every Go routine is going to incur some sort of memory impact and footprint. And of course, you know, management by the underlying runtime and therefore your operating system. So we might want to keep them to a minimum how many Go routine we have running or sitting around. So we might just spin them up for every request. We decide to spin up five Go routine. The one that come back first, we take that answer. And of course, they all exit after they set, submit their answer and so be it, right? So that's a decision you have to make. In our example, we're going to go take this latter approach because since we're talking about Go routine that are small, simple, no need for have to have them sit around. All right. And so that's pretty much where we're going to end our example. But I want you to consider further how you can extend this even more. And you can think now of what I said before. Well, now I showed a line where the hub needs to send back to the client. Well, here is the answer to your particular question, right? And how might we think of this is that we have multiple. We definitely need to do that when we have multiple um, clients and each client is submitting question from its own database and that's submitting the same question. And so when a client submits a question along the red arrow there into the question queue, the hub takes it, wraps it up in a request and distributes it, not, um, you know, just one to one server like load balancing, but rather multiple, um, duplicate the, the same request and send it to all these different, um, go these servers, the same exact question and a server or all the servers going to eventually get around to pulling up an answer for it and putting it back on the response queue that the hub um, creates for the, for the, to get a response. And we could decide that oh, the response queue might be the one that the client submits to the hub and says, hey, when here's my question and I want my response back on this queue. And it might be that very same queue that the hub sends to the server to say, when you answer this question, put the response back on this queue. And so we ensure now that it goes back to the client. All those are decisions you can make as the designer and implementer of the system. We don't show others, I'm just talking about it. Or it could be that the hub maintains like a mapping between the question and the response queue for the client. And then the hub sends out requests, gets the response back, looks at the response because the response contains the question that was answered and the question and says, hey, this question, I'm going to look up at my mapping of question to response channel and find the channel or the client where it has to go back to. So there are a number of ways, again, the same theme coming back. There are more than one ways to do this. And I'm sorry about all the lines, but, um, you know, as you start learning to write more and more complex program, it's going to be a little bit harder to de depict in very simple diagrams. Okay. Um, you have to leave off some lines sometimes. And if you put on all the lines, then then it's really confusing. Okay. So let's get to writing. Okay. Again, um, I, I decided not to make this an exercise and ask you to do it, but feel free to try and play around with the idea. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with where we left off last time, because we kind of, our application is pretty much the same and I'm already in that directory. And so I'm going to start up my editor and now, so one of the things I don't need stop and solution. So, I'm going to remove those 
RM minus RF stub and solution. I don't need those. I don't know where the temporary tree is there anyway. Can't remember. RM minus RF. Temp. All right. All right. So I'm going to do that. Now, this is our data here. And um, so we want some questions. Okay. So I don't even know what questions I should ask, but I'm going to make it very, very simple. And so here we're going to do again, um, huh, I didn't type fast enough. So let's do, I'm going to just do question one and question two, a very creative, right? Question three. And you're going to see, uh, even though I didn't call up any questions before, you see why this doesn't allow me to treat, cheat a little bit. Uh, question four. Okay. So four questions, very, very simple. And so let's go over here to our main thing. And I don't need this go command um, thing. That's from our previous thing. And move this to trash. And here. Hey, why is it complaining? Come on. Uh, that's fine. All right. It doesn't need to come at the end. So again, my thing is just not updating properly. All right. I have to really look into that. That's annoying. All right. So. What did we say we have? Well, I think we pretty much should just start over instead of trying to adopt these functions, we should just start over and write new functions so that we don't get confused with what we're trying to do. Well, what did we say? Now, if we go back to here and we look at what we want to do, we have the questions, we have a client that's going to read the questions and then submit it on a question queue. So let's write that. So we have function client all right well, we can use a little case maybe other case client and our client is going to be reading from a database which we're going to pass in so it's going to be our database d database data and so it's going to be a slice of string and what is it going to do it's going to for d or question equals to range over the questions in our database. And we know that we don't want the index, so we can do that. And we're gonna be submitting our question somewhere. So um, let's do what we usually do, which we say, hey, let's make an output channel where these questions are gonna be going. Make channel and we go channel of strings. And of course, we're gonna return that. And since we're returning the output, we need to make this a go routine. So we're gonna wrap this in this guy like this and make it, hey, what happened? Silly thing. This and then do go FUN function. So anonymous function. I want to launch anonymous function as a go routine here, and it's gonna thing. Now what do we want to do? We want to output each one of these question on that channel. So that seems to be a nice generator pattern there for our client. Okay, generating some question from a database. All right. Um, no. So this allows us to say. That, um, let's make sure we have data here main package also okay all right so we're now gonna say um, Q channel is equals to this client function call so we do um, data all right so that's good so now we have some questions um, coming in on a channel next thing we said we wanted to do was so we have client, now it outputs questions on this channel. We need a hub, which is going to take questions off of here and distribute them. So let's do that. Let's do function hub. And it takes, uh, and oh, we have to return here. So we're going to return a channel on which you can um, get some strings from it. And of course, once this for loop ends, we should definitely close out, um, close that channel. All right. 
So our hub is going to take as input um, this question channel where it's going to be reading some strings off of some questions. And what is it going to do? So it's going to do for question range over this question channel and it's going to make a request. So we're going to say req is equal, you know, is equals to make some request. Make request with this question. We're going to see what making a request is about just now. And after it makes a request, it's going to send it on the out channel, right? So it's out channel. Well, no, it's actually have to distribute it to a number of, um, so copy or duplicate really. D U P L I C duplicate request to some servers, right? And so we have to duplicate this request to a number of servers. Um, and so it's going to spin up some servers. So we're going to hide the logic. Now we're going to see whether we can actually write these as function or anonymous functions here. We're going to replace them. We're going to see. So we're going to make a request, pass it to this function that's going to duplicate it to, to spin up a number of go routines, which is going to be our servers to answer, you know, to respond to those, um, to handle this request. And of course, um, you know, when the response come back. Um, so this is sort of a hub. We could call it a handler if we like. Um, should I go back and change the name? Yes, call it handler. Hmm, doesn't matter. Let's call it, keep it as hub. All right, it doesn't really matter. And so our, um, our this thing guy is gonna send, back, send out and um, now we need to somehow, once we range over, get this um, thing, we also need to be reading um, back those response as they come back. So when we make a request, um, and we're gonna make things very easy and say that uh, all our answers come back on the same channel. So we're gonna say answer channel is equals to make channel of string of, well, huh, let's think about this now right so we have this idea of a request so what is a request really well a request if you remember that though we know how to write structs right structures structures are these things that allow us to wrap up a bunch of different types together with names field so why don't we write that struct call request type request is a struct and a struct has the question that was asked which is a string and we also say that what we want to send in that request, if you remember when we look here, we said, when this send a request, it we want that request to include not only the question, but also the channel on which the response should come back. So we also want to send the channel on which the response should come back. So we want to be able to get a channel that we can read from and we can read the responses, right? Channel of responses. All right, so we're going to send in the request the question, and then we are also going to say, "Hey, for this question, I want you to put the response the response back on this channel." So we're going to send that channel. Now, what is the channel? So that's another type. Type response is a struct. And if you look at this program requirement, it says that uh, a server must respond with the question asked, and how long it took the server basically although it took to compute that response the answer right all right so to answer that question so um the response then should also contain the, the question that we send it should also contain the answer and it should also um the, the duration how long it took right so time that duration right so that should be included and our response right um, you could keep adding here you could put the server ID and a whole bunch of other things that you might want to keep track of right so you know with server and da 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 so um, what happened here um, what was I doing data how is okay 
don't know why that got erased, but okay. So when we make our answer channel, right, what we really want is a channel with four responses, right? That's our answer is our answer is channel of responses. And so when we make a request, what we're really doing is we are saying, well, a request, no, I don't have to use a function. I'm really saying a request is just a, uh, a request is this request object here. And then we initialize it with the question that we have, right? Which is question Q. And then the channel gets um, this answer channel that um, we created here. Does that make sense? So we created a request that says, our request is the question that we pulled off of this question channel and um, you know the channel we want to answer. But that's just one request. How many um, servers do are we sending this same request to, right? And remember, if we just send it on different channels, it gets copied. So we don't actually have to make a new one. So duplicating it to a different server is just a matter of us sitting in a for loop and saying, well, I want to send this to four servers. So I can say for i gets zero, i less than, let's say, three, for example. Um, in our example, we did uh, i equals to zero, i less than two. So that will allow us to send it to two server, right? Zero and one, that's two server, i plus plus. So that would be consistent with what we show on our paper. But remember, this is just an example. You can imagine any number of servers. If we could send to two, we can certainly send to three or four or five or whatever. So let's loop around and then send this same request to a number of servers. So what did we say um, we want um, to do? We just want to launch Go servers to, to do this, right? So we're going to do that. Go, um, create a server. And here is where, you know, remember when we covered this before? I'm going to pass I, so that's the server ID you want to think of it. So I'm going to do the server ID. Now, if I make this like an anonymous thing, remember we talked about a potential pitfall? Go back and look at that video. I think it was um, in section seven or eight or something or nine, pitfall. Okay, so if we use an anonymous function, but I'm not going to use an anonymous function. I'm actually going to write a server here and say function server, which takes int I am ID, which is an int, of course, it doesn't return anything. I'm launching it as a Go routine, so there's no way to get any return value. And what does it do? Well, um, I have to give it its ID, and I also have to give it a copy of the request that I want it to to um, handle, right? To to be able to to serve for me. So, um, so request and copy of request. Okay, makes sense. So I'm passing. ID for the server and a request. Of course, the server is going to take some time to compute a response. How long does it take? Well, let's say it takes 10, 10 nanoseconds, 10 times 10 that nanoseconds, okay, to compute the response. So I can do not after, I can rather do sleep. And then after it took some time to compute the results, it looks it up in its database and it puts send the result back into request that channel, right? And then it sends the response, RESP, response. So how does it compute the response? Well, it looks up an answer. So answer A, you know, is assigned the answer and it now creates a response and it says response is equals to again the response object and the question that it was given, which is request that question. It also needs to send the answer, which it got here, and you know how long it took. So um, in this case, duration is equals to you know. 10 that times that nanoseconds. Well, okay, so my the answer, there we go. So this is two many hard-coded values. So 
we don't want to do that. So um, we want D, the time it's going to take to compute the answer, to be something that's more random and sort of hard to compute because every server is going to take the same time. So it's going to be more like, um, you know, time that, um, so time that duration takes a random that, um, you know, int n, um, let's say 100, and then this is going to be d, and then now we can just assign this to d here, okay? I know, very small variable name, that's one of the things in Go is, Golang is usually very small variable names. And so if you find these to be annoying, keeping track of the field and the value, just use better names than I'm using. Call this duration, call this answer, call this question, right? To spell it out, um, makes sense to you. Now, since we're using the rand package, um, so rand, rand, um, now I want to seed my random number generator. So um, if you also remember, there's this init function that we can type that gets run before anything else. So here we can say run that, that seed and we can say seed it with time that now that unix okay all right so this ensure that it just get run once and before even main get called all right so that's really old school going back to chapter two okay all right so now we have a response hey where's our response r-e-s-p why is it called this R-E-S-P question, da da da, um, R-E-S-P. All right, so I don't know, under, if I have R-E-S-P, okay. I don't know why it invalid operation sent to receive on the channel. Huh, um, oh, uh, da 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 da, I think, oh, I said I will receive on the channel here. So, um, isn't the channel that I, I could send on. I can send response on. All right, so there you go. All right, um, so now um, what do I want to do? So I also want to go um, spin up a hub. So after I create this client that gen generates some questions for me, I want to go spin up this hub, right? This is this client is going to create a is a generator, so I don't have to worry about that. But this hub, I need to go launch it as a go routine, so it's off doing its own thing. So I can call go routine here. I can say go. There's no nothing I expect back from it. Hub go launch this as a go routine, and here is where you get some questions. Reach for questions from there, and as you get questions, um, just loop around until you finish, and you know read this question create a request and then spin up five, in this case, five go routine, but we can make this some number n, all right. So n is some value that we define at the top of our program that we can always change very easily. So um, const n is equals to five, all right? So we have it nicely in one place, all right? And then now spin up five go server so five servers to answer the same question giving them their own id and now we can we're not doing anything with the id here but we could include it in the response we could add to the response the idea of you know server id for example server id is an int and so now when we create a response we can also say server id gets id so we know which server is responding or which one we t came back first. And now notice the way I got my answer now is the same answer. You know, I'm sending the same answer for each server, but we'll fix that eventually, right? So let's make this a to-do. Um, look up answer in database, right? And I put database in quote because we don't really have a database, right? All right, so bam, that looks like um, that's going to work. 
um, you haven't done anything yet. You haven't run anything yet. But um, so for my hub, um, it's the answer channel that it's using. Um, I don't have access to it because it's internal. So maybe we should have our hub return that answer and then just go launch this whole part. So that way we have access to the answer channel. So here's the answer channel. Answer channel, we're gonna come get that back from the hub. And so the hub should return um, a channel on which you can read responses from, right? And okay, that's what it makes here. And it's gonna return that, um, you know, answer channel, answer channel. And of course, we need it to go launch this whole thing like this and like that. Uh, come on, guys. And go F U N C. Right? Does that make sense now? Um, I have to get my, my browser is sometimes way too helpful. I press it with the help, and other times it's doing silly things like it doesn't correct this. Okay. So now we're getting back some answers here. Or this is going to, when we launch this part, this for a loop that's reading from questions will eventually quit when there are no more questions because here we're going to do close. And then, so it's going to eventually exit and return. And of course, our Go servers, they only come up answer one question and then they die. So we always create a set of servers to answer a particular question and they have to race to see who is gonna be the first. So since we have this guy is going to um, be essentially, well, he's gonna sit around and just be getting um, question, questions, questions. After all the questions, we've gotten all the questions, well, he certainly should go away also and so um, now okay there is a potential problem here because our when we get one question question a from a client we come here we launch all these go routines five go routines or homage to ask to respond to that one question eventually all five of them might come back it doesn't matter some one might come back first or whatever but um, they eventually gonna come back, right? And what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to um, just say it. Just we just want the first answer, and that's it. So how do we do that? So we have to think through this. So um, for each um, question that we take, we should probably make a different answer channel. And then we launch a answer channel. Um, we launch a go routine with that answer channel, and it is waiting on that answer channel. And once it gets an answer, it the first answer it just returns it, close the channel, and then exit. So I know this is going to look a little bit complex. So here is. Um, what we're going to do return to the user is not really the entire response. The user doesn't need to see which server responded and how long the server took. Rather, what the user needs to see, so this guy, we're going to launch a answer channel for each question. So every time we get a question, we're going to make a answer channel where we get the response from that server, pass it to the server, and Logio Server asks them to, to work on it. But what we want to do also, in addition to that, is not only launch the Go servers to be able to get the answer for this request, but we also want to launch a Go routine that will read from this answer channel that we made for this particular question. Okay? This is within here, this for loop, every time we're in this for loop is just one question we're dealing with. So we need to have a go routine that's going to sit there and for however long it takes, 
um, it's going to um, range over so actually no, we don't even want to forward we just want to select select from um, the case this answer channel and let's just pass that in so we don't have any problem with our race condition so answer channel we can call my answer channel so we don't get any confusion my answer channel so it's going to try and read the an answer from my answer channel okay and we'll do something with it we'll see what we're gonna do and then we have like a default if it takes too long okay so we can launch a go routine and this guy is gonna get the answer channel that we created for this question right so every time we come around we're gonna make a answer channel a response channel and we're gonna send it to some um, servers because it's already packaged in the request and we launch those servers but we're also going to launch one go routine that sits there on this channel which we're going to pass in here and it's trying to do a select and the first answer it gets off of that channel well that's the answer we want that's the first because all these go routines going to eventually send an answer on this channel and so the first one that's why it does a case statement i'm not doing a loop i'm just doing a select i'm going to read that results off of there and once I read it, I'm going to send it to the output. So this is the, the output out. Now, where, what is out really? Out is the channel that our hub is spitting out all these answers on. Okay. So our hub is making a out channel, make channel of string, which is the responses, which is just the answer, sorry. But I was doing this with note the answers. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend the answer, prepend the answer and the question together. So um, we'll find a way to do to do the two. Um, so what? So if you no. So this is answer is a response. So really, what we're gonna do is um, let's. Hmm. Let's let's do some. Yeah, I'll simplify it, make it simple, and I'll say that so what we're gonna send back is really the answer that question, right? And so no, this hub is not returning that. It's returning just string. So answer that question because that's what we pull now from this answer channel. My answer channel. Why is it saying my answer channel is undefined? Oh, of course, I didn't put a type here. My answer channel is basically a channel of responses, okay, on which you can read from. And so it reads an answer and it has the question in that answer. And so we're gonna prepend also the question plus the answer. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Now, why do I have default here? Well, what if what I really want is to have these, I want to give these go routine a certain time in which to respond. So this is my timeout here. I, I call it default here, but timeout. So the timeout is how long a, once this guy launches, a go routine has to wait for an answer. So I should pass the timeout also here. So once I create the question, I'm gonna give them a certain time to get back with an answer. So, um, so case, case, wait on this timeout. I'm gonna show away the result, of course. Right, wait on that. And of course, if, um, if I don't have, if I don't get a response, I can output, you know, the um, question 
plus, you know, no answer or no server response. No server responded, right? I know this is getting really complicated, right? Well, you know, as you write more and more complex program, this is what happened. Range variable queue captured by function literal. Okay, so um, what is happening here is because inside this go routine, um, I'm referring to queue. It it says captured by, right? Um, so, <clears throat> oh, I don't have enough argument here. So the timeout, I also need to pass timeout, and we can call it max wait time or something like that, and here we're going to create a max wait time so i get a question i make a response channel for that question where i want the answers for that question to come back i make a request sending that question with where the answer should come back i launch some go routine to start working on that question and i launch a go routine node to wait for that the first response or a timeout to occur and if i get the first response i send it out if not, my timer is going to expire and I send, you know, some crazy message about it. Now, the only thing I need now is to actually construct this max time, right? How long? So these things are going to happen really fast, but I'm going to say that when we make the, we get a question and we make a response before we can send it to any go routine, we should start the timeout. So I'm going to actually create my timeout over here. I'm going to put colon equal and then I'm going to say time that after, and then we're going to, now we can use a constant and say, well, let's give everything um, a maximum of, no, we know that how um, we use what, a uh, hundred milliseconds, where was it? We're, um, each server here was taking like a hundred milliseconds max, right? So some name could be less than that, some could be late. So, um, here is max time out. We're going to do 50 times time that nanosecond. Okay. So we're giving them up to 50 nanoseconds to come up with an answer. But of course, um, you know, they can take up to 100. All right. All right. So um, let's use some constant to make our code a little bit better. Um, const max server time. No, this doesn't need to be kept a letter, right? I'll cap all caps or whatever, but I'm going to make it all caps to make it easier to read. Notice the cancel. Max server time is equals to 100. So this is how long the server can take to respond. So max server time. And what I'm going to do is just give them half of whatever the max server time is to respond. All right, good. Uh, I'm going to assume that I cannot use max time da, 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 as type. Um, where is my function? Oh, there we go. Um, so this is timeout is really a channel of time, right? Channel of time that time. Okay. That's what max time is. Okay, so I'm passed that in, and um, I could have mean I could have created the time inside of this routine when I launch it to um, think. Actually, that might actually make the code even better, easier to read. Is um, bam here? I don't have to pass the time in when I launch this guy to read some things. Uh, he created timeout, and he says, "Okay, this is how long I'm going to be trying to read from these guys." and timeout right so oh what would I do uh, jump up there okay so now um, one of the things we can do is we can say all right let's launch yep it doesn't matter because these are gonna launch really fast so we can decide whether we want to start the, the function to wait on the response first and then start launching them or we launch it that way doesn't really matter that much. All right, so, oh, Q. So my question, we should probably pass in the question into our um, guy here, just in case he doesn't get a response from the servers, he knows what the question is. Just um, 
we don't have to worry with too much of capturing a question and all that stuff. Curious to capture. So it pass in Q here. Okay. And so this Q will be passing in is this Q. And then here, this Q is his question. So the question. This is what is going on here. Uh, the question. All right? So, 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 which is, well, is no problem here when he gets a response because the question is inside of that response. So that's not a problem. All right. And it's not really a problem here. We just was getting a warning. It was capturing the variable. Um, this minimizes all that stuff with us twisting our heads around. It's capturing it. So we just pass it in. Now, if you find all this too confusing, just take this and turn it into a function call the handler or something like this and just pass those and say go handler. And actually, let's just do that because it's right. It makes for clearer, cleaner code. So we grab this and we can pull it out here as a function and we can call it handler because it's the thing that's handling the responses. Okay. So we have a handler and um, of course, now that oh, we don't have access to out, we also have to pass the out shadow. So this is the um, out shadow. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so what we can do is we can make this very easy by saying that our handler just re re return with, well, we can do go um, thing. So we have to give it the output to write its response. So we give that there and we say, um, we have out is a channel on which we can send stuff. And so that is channel, which we can send our, the, the answer. And so there we go. And this guy gets out. All right. So kind of simplify things a little bit now that see it. So for any question that we get from the question channel, make a response channel, construct a request, launch some server to answer that request, the same exact request, then launch a handler, which is going to read the answers from those servers, one of those servers, and it also knows the question, and it's gonna write it out to our output that we're gonna to return to the user who called the hub, okay? So this is, is just gonna keep churning away, churning out handlers, churning out servers, and we don't even know how many. Well, we know maybe five servers per question plus one handler, so that's every question launches six Go routine, okay? But these go routines end and this server also end because once this server sits there, gets the first, it starts a timeout. Once it gets, if the timer expires, then it sends this and it ends. If it gets an answer back from one of the servers, well, it reads that answer, sends it out, and then it also ends. And of course, since this is going to get cleaned up, the out channel is later on, well, it only writes one answer on the out channel. But this answer channel where there were possibly five, you know, answers because we had five servers that were launched, it's going to get cleaned up since nobody's referencing it. So we depend on the Go um, memory manager to do all that stuff. Now, if we had to manage all this stuff in like C, C++ and all that stuff, oh man, right? Trying to keep track of when stuff needs to be cleaned up. So we don't have to think about it. All right. So that should get us with our handle or hub going. Um, the hub returns where we can read the answers. Um, we don't need to worry about the hub because the up is going to end once it has no more question to read. And we can close now that once this ends and there's no more no more questions to read, we can close the output channel. So that signals to whoever um, is getting handling this, which is our main program, which is gonna be a for loop that's gonna range over on the answers. A, let's say, um, and I'm cheating a little bit as you're gonna see. Um, so answer range over, you know, this answer channel that we get back from the hub, and we're gonna print it out, and we can do fmt 
at print and we're going to print out the question the, the answer now my answer here because i cheated here my answers essentially includes the question colon and the answer but we could have come up with some other type called the answer or client response or something like that which includes both the question and the answer so here what we really send him back it shouldn't be the question separated um, colon with a thing we can actually send back and let's make sure this work and then we'll come back and clean it up okay let's do that let's make sure it works we have a lot of code here so let's make sure this work fmt um why is it oh, oh yes i keep forgetting every time i see this red thing that my editor is kind of weird right now go run main and data we have data and we have a problem so we have go routine is running send and close channel okay so where did that occur so we have a thing in our logic and so another go um so here we see main go 64 main go um 49 so 49 and 62 49 and 62 so let's see what's happening at 62 so we're trying to send on this channel out and 49 here so we have a go handler out so we launched um, so yeah so we should be huh oh so what might be happening is um, we have a race condition here where we get a question and we send it off to our servers they haven't finished computing their answer yet but because we finish <laughs> getting a response um, question we're like oh good close the channel so we can't close the channel until we have what until our last excuse me until our last um handler is finished writing its response all right so that's the only time when we can close it up so before we can close it up we have to wait until our handler um, thing so we need a wait group that wait all right so we have to wait before we close here and how do we do that? Well, we have to create a weight group. So let's do that. Weight group var weight group um, that's sync weight group. Okay. All right. So how do we initialize our weight group? Well, every time we launch one of these guys, we don't really care about the servers. The servers are getting cleaned up and stuff, and um, they're gonna exit, and so we don't need to wait on them. And the guy who's waiting on them is the handler. So we, we don't need to worry about the servers because this guy's already waiting on them and eventually he's going to give up if they take too long. So every time we launch a Go handler, we need to add to our wait group. So we can do, um, come on, wait group that add one. And that's every time we launch this guy. But we also want our wait group to tell us when it's, finished right we need this guy to say hey uh, I, I i'm done um you know i send i, I either got an answer and i sent it or i, I give up on a, the servers so before i return i want to tell you that oh, i'm done so hey i'm done but he also needs um this weight group so i don't know where to put it but let's put it to the end here so we go weight group that pointer to sync that weight group remember we have to do be careful with the whole copy and stuff right and so here we pass to this guy ampersand weight group okay so we add one before we launch a handler and then um we the handler is going to decrement that when it's done and then of course here we wait until whichever handlers are outstanding before we close the channel and so we don't close the channel before the handlers can get to write their results so this should fix our problem and there you go as you can see we have question one the answer question two no server responded then question three the answer question four the answer okay so that seems to work all right good all right so two things we can do we might not like how this is you might want to um you know encapsulate this in a type and maybe that should be an exercise Mm, uh, I didn't plan on giving exercise to do, but 
as you can see that's very easy to do just turn this response into call it client response and make it a um a, a type so I'll, I'll put the stub for that and make it a to do so here's the to do so one to do um response uh no that's not here it should be um to do the output should be instead of a string it should be um a type so uh this output here should be channel of client response right and of course you have to create the client response type here so to do struct type okay I even give you that and it should contain what uh, the question and the answer okay so when you respond to the client if they send multiple question they know which question and which answer and so you could kind of see that I cheated and did it here but you could wrap that in a type okay all right so you have to change a few places no things so only do you have to make the type here but you also have to make sure that oh no this is a channel of client response and then once you have that, it's very easy here. You just, when you compute, you go to do send back your answer, you just create in a client response here for these two places. So um, you have a to do to do here, which is um, to do create client response object, you know, and then same thing is going to happen here so both places you got to create a client response makes sense let's see does the thing reformat um yep just reformat in my comment and putting it right there okay so here's the last thing we i said we had as a to do which was to look up our answer in a database so our database we can of course read from um just like how we have um, the data here, um, which we're going to rename to questions. Now we can also, um, do the same thing and have answers, right? And so for our answers, there we go. Answer, answers. We can, um, this guy we're gonna make it questions of course we have to change this in our main program now and now for our answers this is going to be a map of string to string okay and of course we know how to do a map of um, of um, string to chain so we just question one the answer is And so now, um, if we go back to our main program and we're looking for an answer, well, our answer is simply to 
get from the questions database, put the question in and see what answer we have. All right? Um, okay, this needs to be updated. It's still not um, playing. Oh, I, <laughs> I'm silly. Var, um, so when we make a map, uh, we gotta make our map. So, um, so we gotta do var question um, map make sorry make a map of string to string and then answer is equals to you know and well we don't have to actually make it we can uh, yeah we this is fine yeah we can initialize our map and the uh, answers right there yeah we have to make it okay uh, we don't need a runtime map so this is fine all right so all right so now we can say let's go run hmm, control c uh, go run main with the questions and the answers and uh, q where is that um 81 uh, 81 here we go um this is a request and so for a request the answer is going to be the request that question all right so go run hey come on no slice type what is that 81 non integer slice type um why am i getting non integer Um, question so request that question that's a string okay and my oh answers ah. answers is what I want here answers answers and so makes sense so there we go so these servers are not responding fast enough and there we go all right so as you can see as you run this you get um depending on how fast the servers are responding you know you get different responses all right so hopefully this was um sort of uh interesting example i know this video is again long very long but i sort of walk you through it and you work with me and watch me make mistakes and everything and correct them and if you have the time do try try and make this um, do the to-do here. I uh, didn't really plan an exercise, so I'll just leave it as that. All right. Take care and see you in the next video. Thanks for your time. And I think we can, we are, we have done enough now with the go routines that we can just review what they are at the end and then in the next video, and then we are ready to move on to the next chapter. All right. See you in the next video. Subscribe, please spread the word. Ask your friends and family to subscribe and take care. Bye.